No, it's fine, I just pressed it. Just when, when I stopped. Oh, 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 no, 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 no. Okay, um, is everyone here? Okay, perfect. Uh, so, yeah, cool. Yep. Okay, so, uh, we are going to start. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, like how to be effective when you develop uh, essentially web apps, but actually lots, a huge part of the talk is going to be about OS tooling and editors and stuff, so it's not only about JavaScript, but today it's more about like web application and basically how to be faster and more efficient. Um, some notes about me, so I'm French, uh, I'm working full time uh, for a company like doing Node.js development, so it's JavaScript of the day. Um, I've been coding for web, for the web in general for about a year and a half now. Uh, before that I was a uh, full time front end engineer, but again like full JavaScript. Uh, and yeah, I really like JavaScript. Uh, all tooling stuff uh, and also ice skating and it's mainly about the tooling and javascript that I'm here like, to, to tell you some stuff. Everything I'm going to, to tell is more about like my experience and how I work. It's not like the right and unique way uh, but I feel like, I hope at least like people are going to learn some useful things. So why did you come to Taiwan? <laughs> <laughs> you mean Taiwanese are not efficient? No, because uh, I mean there are many other places you can go. So what? Oh, uh, well, it's kind of a long story. Uh, we can talk about that later. <laughs> it, has, it has actually nothing to do about that. Wait, well, you don't have a slide for that? It must be about Chinese. I should probably make one. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will think about that later next time. Uh, so I'm going to start this with Larry Wall. Um, we who is the creator of Perl, it's a programming language, so a very smart guy, obviously if you write your own programming language. And, and he tells like these are the three qualities of a software engineer, like you have to be lazy, impatient, and arrogant. Uh, why is that? Laziness, it's because uh, it's going to drive you uh, towards automation. You don't want to do something again, again, again. Uh, and automation is good. I will go. I will go back to this later. Uh, laziness is also what is going to make you write useful programs first for you and hopefully for a lot of people. Uh, impatience. Uh, it's when you uh, don't like when a program like takes too long. It will lead you to write more uh, efficient and faster program. Uh, I will go back to that later also because speed is important. Like to stay focused. And pride or hubris, um, it's like uh, it's going to make you write better program in the sense that you don't want other people to tell bad things about your code. And you you want to do things the right way and not to get shit done as fast as possible. Sometimes you have to do that, but uh, if you want to like have something which works and which is maintainable, uh, you usually need to take pride in your work. And so, this talk will be mainly about uh, OS level tools and server management for the first part. A small part about Node.js, uh, because I feel there are like some tools which are not very well known and still very useful. And the last part is going to be like in the browser and really like how to do web development. Uh, I talked about speed and I'm going to talk a lot about speed during this talk. And uh, what you see here, is from a study uh, from Google about web performances. Mostly uh, the impact of the time uh, between the, the, the time between the user click on the URL and when the page is loaded. And how, how does that impact the retention? And you can see like here uh, the, 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 the key point is this one second. If something takes more than one second uh, the human brain will have like uh, a, a context switch. Uh, it's really hard like to stay completely focused on one thing more than one second if you are just waiting. Uh, so if you can improve your your workflow to decrease the waiting time for any operation, like. 
from two seconds to less than one second, it's a huge win because then uh, if it takes more than one second, you're going to think, oh yeah, right, I have this email I have to answer, or wait, I thought I fixed this bug, I, I have to check this class. And so you are going to like slightly change, uh, please, like there, is, there are still more seats. Uh, so yeah, uh, about impatience, this is where it comes from. If you can get below one second, it's very good. And also like if you want, like if you are optimizing your application, the one second threshold is also a good value to keep in mind. So, uh, first key to be efficient is like automation. Uh, be lazy and avoid repetition. Uh, basically, like find tools and everything you can do like to avoid doing the same task over and over again. Uh, it's boring and it's not very useful. Uh, so, about tooling for the operating system. Uh, embrace the command line. Like the command line is scary. It scares a lot of people. Like when they see a command line, they don't even think about it. It's oh, this guy is a hacker. I can't understand. Uh, but actually, it's super fast. Uh, like graphical interfaces are pretty nice when you start something, when you want to, when you don't know exactly what you want, or when you want to discover new things. Command line, the graphical interface, I think, is superior. But when you know exactly what you want to do, you know, I want to compile this, I want to debug that, I want to run my test. Command line, you can do that in less than uh, 200 milliseconds. And it's highly customizable. Uh, it's very easy to add more shortcuts uh, on scripts and programs. Uh, so you can be really fast. I'm going to, to show you something. Uh, just for the poor souls who are running Windows, uh, I'm on Linux, like I've been on Linux for like 10 years maybe. So I don't really know Windows at all. I just, like, there is WinBash on PowerShell. WinBash is a port of Bash, which is uh, the, the default scripting uh, shell in Linux on macOS. And this has been ported to Windows, so you can try that. And PowerShell is a really good uh, shell for Windows. If you try like CMD on Windows, you get a shell. But it's a sucky one, like it's completely useless. Uh, never use it, like you're, you're going to lose your sanity. PowerShell is actually decent. Um, so, uh, Nix like OS, uh, it works for every Linux on macOS. macOS has a Linux kernel, so what I'm saying about short, uh, command line works on macOS almost always. Uh, you can customize your shell, try different things, like the default one in Linux is Bash, but ZSH, ZSH and the Fish shell are actually very nice too. And you can like learn some stuff. So, uh, here is a little demo. So, um, let's try with... Uh, okay, uh, so this is the default shell and what you're going to see when you install a new OS and a new user. And this is pretty useless, like you have limited color support and it's not super nice. Uh, what I have now, it's like, uh, first what you see, so more colors, I have a timestamp, and I know where I am, this is in my home. So let's say uh, I can zoom, I can go there, uh, blah. Uh, is it clear by the way? Is it big enough? Yeah, clear. Um, I have that, uh, let's say uh, I can also do this kind of thing, uh, and stuff. So uh, what you can see here, um, here, uh, I'm, so I can navigate very quickly wherever I want, so I, I, I know where I am. Uh, this is the host, so I know I'm on my laptop. Uh, this is the git branch where I am now, so when I'm in the git repository, I, I know instantly where I am. I have also this, which tells me uh, you have something which is not committed inside the repository, I just created a file. And I have some shortcuts which can tell me uh, quickly what's going on exactly. I have blah which is not committed. Um, there is also so uh, cat is uh, you just dump the content of a file onto your command line. So when you want to see something, it's pretty useful. Uh, but this is actually a Python program. I alias to have like nice colors. Uh, much better when you are looking for some for some things. Um, at the beginning, I also used something. Z, Z, which is a file jumper, which allow me to go everywhere I went before. 
So you CD somewhere, and then you never have to, to type that. So I was in like meetup, efficient workflow. Uh, let's try F, E, F, F, and it's enough. I'm already there. Uh, so when you want to navigate between like huge projects, this is invaluable. And you have more stuff like uh, tree, uh, tree to, to display stuff, or uh, this one I have to install it. Anyway, uh, so as you can see, like you can customize it. And there is also, let's try this one. Um, okay, so I'm connecting to a remote box. It's a little bit slow because um, the server is actually in France. Uh, so yeah. Uh, I think, yeah. Cool. And here you see, uh, I am already, I know I'm not on my, on my machine anymore. Okay. So, uh, you can do some crazy stuff. Uh, this is basically how I use my shell. Uh, feel free like, to experiment and find what is useful for you. Um, oh, and there, there is also a, a different thing. Uh, remember, like uh, before, I typed something like uh, I cat the package.json. So if you type up, 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 you can go up on your history, and here you are. Uh, but you have also other stuff like uh, to search inside your history. So if I remember, I typed something with package.json, I can directly find that. So also key binding. If I want to, like, I have a command which starts with ca, and then I can. I can look all of this, uh, all of the command which started with this. Uh, so you can really like customize it and save a lot of time. Okay, uh, so yeah, I demoed like this for the file jumper. Uh, if you're working with Java project, which are SRC, uh, main Java com, your company dot com and stuff, it's super useful. Uh, the C. Uh, is an alias to Python, a Python program fragmentized, which adds some nice colors depending on the file type. Uh, there is a chair there. Uh, one. Okay. okay. And also something very really useful is that you can share your history between shells. So here, uh, this is a shell I just used, and let's try another one. So I'm here, and here let's say C, and I look my history, and here it is. Uh, so if you are like running a command inside a shell and you realize, hey, I need some other information in another shell, you don't have to type the command again. You can just share the history between every, every one of your terminals and it will save a lot of time. Um, yep. So uh, this one goes back to the screen and I go back to the page. Okay. So, right. Uh, yeah. So that's my workflow with shells. But usually, like you'd like to experiment and find what's useful for you. Uh, as a general rule, you want when you are working to have always like some kind of uh, external viewpoint, which tells you when you are doing something repetitive, which you have to like stop. I just did the same thing three times in a row. Can I improve on that? Can I find a way to improve that? Uh, the, the rationale is not because you are going to, to save time. Usually you are going to spend more time setting up your tools than uh, actually saving time. But where it's important, it's because uh, the time you are going to save after will let you focus on your task. Remember the one second threshold. If you, if you start doing some repetitive tasks, you are you're going to think about other things. And it's a huge hit on productivity. Uh, so yeah, like trying to not be repetitive is mostly about like staying focused on your tasks. Um, about server management, uh, use SSH keys. Uh, you don't with SSH key you don't have to input your username and password every time. Uh, if you are, uh, if you want better security, like here I'm more secure. If you really want super security, you can add passphrases to your keys. So when you want to use a key, you have to enter a password. And then there is a SSH config, which can allow you to customize your uh, your SSH pretty nicely. So remember, uh, when I connected, 
So SSH Geeking Frog. Geeking Frog is not a correct um, name, a, a correct address for a web server, uh, but it works. And I have auto completion on that, just that, just pub, and I have this. Then I enter, and I'm not going to be asked for any password or anything. It's I'm, or, I'm already logged in. Uh, this is through SSH agent and SSH config. Uh, let me show you the. Um, so this is my SSH config file, where you can specify. Uh, so here. You see, so I have a host Geeking Frog. I tell SSH actually you have to connect to geekingfrog.com, that's the real name of the server. And for this one, you have to use this key. If you have like a lot of keys, it's super useful. And you can you can use this config file to specify like a lot of things. If you want to connect with the display, if you want the display of the server or where you are, you can configure that through this file. Um, it's usually very useful. If you are working in a company uh, with, let's say, at least five people or at least one DevOps, uh, ask them about that. DevOps people are experts about like managing stuff from the command line and remotely and efficiently. If you want to learn more, just ask your DevOps how it does, and usually you will be blown away. Like they are super efficient tool. This is only the, the simplest thing. Okay. Um, a little bit about the code editor or the IDE. Um, I'm not going to recommend everything, like this is a holy war, uh, but this is the basic minimum you, you need to have. Syntax selecting and basic indentation support. By that standard, Notepad is not a code editor. Okay? Um, plus you can have like lots of stuff, like snippets, autocomplete, hinting, compiling, version control, keyboard shortcuts, uh, whatever you choose. Uh, Remember, find something which is adapted to your task. So, for example, um, vim blah.html. Uh, at some points, I had to write quite a lot of uh, HTML stuff. So, basically, you have to write all of this shit uh, slash HTML and etc. etc. And then I got tired of that and I found this uh, tool actually write stuff faster. So just body, let's say I want uh, a title um, and stuff like that. With that you can like have, oops, uh, you can have a very very nice uh, editor which which allow you to go much much faster. And about indentation like uh, if you have something like which is not indented at all, you can automatically indent correctly. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, kind of the basic, like you see I have syntax correction. Um, yeah. uh, nowadays, like editors, I'm using Vim, but like Sublime Text, or uh, I don't know, uh, IntelliJ, or uh, PHP Storm, whatever. Uh, these are a real beast, and with a lot of options. Learn your editor. Try to really see at least what feature it offers, and how to access them. If you find you're, you're doing one action really often, find the shortcut to do that. Uh, find how to be usually like not wasting time or whatever. If you have your both hands on your keyboard all of the time, that's where you are the most productive, when you don't have to reach for the mouse. Um, so yeah, that's about editor. Uh, it really pays to learn your editor uh, for to avoid like repetition, being faster, and it's usually way, way more comfortable. Um, about version control, because it's an important part, uh, if you don't use any kind of version control, stop programming right now and learn it. I'm serious about this. You are just like, uh, every time you, 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 you produce something and you put that in production without version control, like some kittens are going to be killed in horrible tortures. No, really. Um, if you use something like SVN or CVS, which are centralized, let's try a decentralized one, like Git or Micro. These are the two most popular. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Git because this is what I know. A uh, decentralized version control system allows you to do like very cool stuff. Like you're working on a feature, uh, you're hacking, okay, perfect. And then a colleague told you, hey, uh, we have a bug there. And you say, oh yeah, it's a really small one. But you cannot change branch and go back on the master branch because you are still working 
Um, if you are using a centralized version control system, you will have to make a commit, I'll go back on the other branch, change your, make your fix, test it, push it, and then go back. So it's actually uh, not that super efficient. So there are some git bases you have to know, and these are most uh, a few commands which are not very well known. Uh, is it big enough? Uh, let's try plus. Doesn't work. Anyway, uh, so stash, uh, add patch, rebase, and re interactive rebase. Basically, like stash and add patch is a way like to to have more uh, control over what you are going to commit when and where. And rebase allow you to like completely rewrite your history. It's extremely powerful to keep to, to keep uh, a very clean tree. Uh, you can also shoot yourself in the in the foot with that. But uh, these are really like powerful commands and very useful sometimes. You are not going to use them every day. Like the rebase, you are not going to use that every day. But when you need that, it's really nice. Um, about customization, uh, all I most of the thing I, I showed you about like shell customization, uh, my editor, uh, it's usually a mix-like system controlled by dot file, dot .vmrc, dot uh, .rc stuff. Uh, there is a community on GitHub on dot file, so this is a link. I'm going to put the presentation and tell it after. So uh, we have lots of people put their dot files there. So have a look there and see if you can find some useful and interesting stuff. Uh, like my, my configuration file doubled up after I discovered this. Um, yeah, really learn your tool. If you are using a tool, whatever it is, every day, it really pays to know exactly how to use it uh, really well. Um, and that's about it for OS and servers. Do you have any question, remark? I, I see that you didn't use like a uh, screen or a Tmux when you're, when you're um, on your remote server. Is there a reason why? Um, screen? I don't know how to use screen. Um, what I do usually is I have a tab. Here you can see on the top, I have multiple tabs. Oh, okay. uh, on Tmux, I will switch to Tmux probably next month. At least give it a try. I heard a lot of people telling very good things about this. Um, I will try it. Yeah. Um, again, like this is my, how I work. But if you think like other things are worth it, just try them and adapt them. Uh, your workflow is very personal. This is how you get more effect efficient, not how your coworker is going to be more efficient. Other questions? Yeah, yeah. Could you, could you go into more detail about um, get stash and rebase? Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, let's try a demo. Uh, so uh, get status. Oh yeah, right. Um, okay, uh, let's say. Uh, okay, whoops, a little bit big. Okay, so here. No, 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 no. Uh, okay, so here I am on the master branch with nothing on my uh, on my tree. Yeah, I'm perfectly clear. Let's say I'm going to work uh, on a new branch. So cool new feature, for example. Oh yeah, right. Uh, okay, so now I'm on another branch. Yeah, the CO is an alias and my usual machine. SVN, is it? Yeah. You're moving from SVN, you can just go CO for checkout. Git doesn't like the, the oh. abbreviations. Uh, you can you can define any alias you want for Git. Oh, okay. Uh, with Git alias, uh, you can do whatever you want, but this. Laptop is seven year old and I barely use it, so uh, I'm used to my alias on uh, other machines. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, actually, you can see on um, on your home, you have a dot git config file where you have everything, and in the end, uh, at the end, you can have uh, an alias thing, and here you can add more stuff. Yeah, you can add through the command line too. So uh, I'm on a cool new feature. Uh, let's say touch uh, foo dot js. Okay, let's try, let's edit something, uh, and then uh, hop. Yep. And 
may return false. So this is completely useless, but it's still cool. So um, you see I have one untracked file which is foo.js. Uh, let's say I'm going to add it, it add foo.js. So now it's oops. Uh, it's on my tree and it's not yet committed. Uh, if I want oh um, the thing is, uh, like right now a colleague told me like, master is completely down, there is a big bug and you see, oh you're right, it's a stupid bug but I have to fix it now. Uh, except that this file is clearly not ready to be committed. Uh, so what you do is actually you stash it. Uh, get stash, uh, oh wait, uh, untracked file doesn't work. So let's modify something different, like the uh, index for example. Uh, let's say I change the title uh, to uh, sim title. Okay, uh, so now uh, I have I modified the index, but I don't want to commit it now. Uh, I can just git stash, um, and it's going to save it. Uh, git stash list. Um, so here you see I have one stash. It's kind of a commit, but it's not written anywhere in the commits tree. Uh, and now you see, um, let's get rid of this. Uh, I'm again as if I haven't touched anything. So it has, it has been saved uh, elsewhere. Um, if I read the index, uh, you will see that the, the title uh, has been reverted back to the original thing. Now I can uh, get, uh, check out, uh, I can go back to the master branch, make my fix, and then again go back to the feature branch, stash pop. And it's going to replace the change, and now my Vim, uh, my index, will have the new, the new title there. Okay. So Stash allow you to create a temporary commits which are not written anywhere, uh, just to temporarily save your work if you want a clean, a clean stage. And Rebase allow you to um, merge two commits uh, when you have like uh, three or five commits, you can get two and squash them together, uh, remove some commits, it's extremely powerful. If you want, if you have like um, a usual case, it's like, uh, so let's say you have the master branch there uh, with, with some commits and here you started your new feature, so this is another branch, a uh, new feature. Uh, with rebase, what you can do is uh, say, okay, let's imagine my new feature actually starts from there. So you can say, because to stay current with other branches, you can rewrite the history. This is, a, this is a very powerful thing. So then when you merge, it's actually very easy. So it's, it's different from pull rebase? No, the pull rebase does that. So rebase is the same as pull dash dash? Pull, rebase. pull rebase does two things. Pull rebase fetch, uh, and then uh, rebase your branch uh, against the remote branch. And this you can, but you can actually rebase against any branch. It's uh, it's a detail. Like, pull rebase is higher level than just rebase. Uh, you can learn like there are tons of documentation. It is complex, but there are tons of documentation. And you can like if you are more interested, you can talk about it later or just read the documentation. Like it's very complex, but it pays to to know at least it's possible. Okay, uh, let's talk about Node.js. Node.js is JavaScript on server side, which is a crazy idea. But it actually works, and it's how I'm actually earning money now. Version management use NVM. Uh, there is no other way around. NVM, like there are other versions, like for Ruby or virtual for Python, uh, it makes it allows you to have multiple uh, node, not just version at the same time. Let's try. Uh, so here, node uh, I Here I have the, the latest version of node. Uh, but if I tell uh, where is my node, it's, it's actually here in my home folder. And you can see there is a version. Uh, with npm, I see, OK, I also installed the temps. So npm uh, use, let's say, dot pen. And now, node-v, here. The, the version of node change. This is extremely useful when you are developing for node.js. You want to see, does my application support the latest version of node? 
no problem. Just run your test with that. It's uh, independent. It's local to your uh, terminal, so you can have multiple versions at the same time. Uh, extremely powerful. Um, if you are Ruby or Python developers, there are other solutions. I don't know for Java, PHP, or else. Sorry. Um, Node monitor. Extremely useful too. It allows you to restart your node application and every single change on file system. Uh, let's do a small demo. Uh, yep, perfect. So uh, here, uh, let's try index. Perfect. So this is a very very small node application which just creates a, a server and outputs some CV text with a counter. Uh, so let's actually try it. There is almost no real estate on this screen, so it's going to be bear with, bear with me for a second. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, the, you know, okay. So uh, not many folks. Uh, uh, let's use the latest one, uh, and then. Uh, so if I do like node uh, index.js, okay, so I have my put my server on port one one one. Let's let's see how the exactly how does that work. Yeah. Uh, okay. <coughs> um, okay. Apparently there is an error. Uh, blah 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 line line eight. Uh, so what's this error? Line eight. Oh right. What is this shit? Okay, so so clearly this line is completely wrong. So I have to fix that. Uh, the the clear fix is like on plus plus, and that's it. So if I save my file here, uh, it's actually not going to do anything. So I have to actually go to the other shell. Uh, interrupt the task and restart the application, which is very. Uh, if you have to do that a lot, it's super annoying. So you use not monitor on index. So what it does? It's actually okay. So it's watching the file system here. Uh, it's watching everything. And if I do a change on the index, for example, let's do that here. Uh, so. Right now, so it was in this version, so I set the file and here it restarted. So here I should still, so here I have my error. Now let's fix the error. Uh, oh, now it's fixed. I save it, uh, the plus, okay, so it, now it stayed. And pow, it works. And I didn't have to restart my knowledge application. Not monitor, restart your application. Very, very useful. Um, and um, you have also, so after node monitor, there is also node inspector. Uh, this is an advanced debugging tool. Uh, when you are really stuck, like, usually when something breaks, the first reaction is where the logs? And then I'll put more log, console log, log, console log, log. And you, you log everything. This, this kind of works for simple log, but when you, have, when you are against like, something really heavy, uh, use node inspector. It's basically you have the dev tools, uh, you have a JavaScript debugger inside your uh, inside your your browser, and you can inspect your application. So let's try it. Um, where is it? Right. So I have this. Um, so you have you have to to start first. Uh, where where is my focus? Okay, uh, first you have to start the node inspector as a background program. Oh, wait, wait. Okay, uh, it's a global module, so node inspector. Okay, I will go about this command a little bit after npm, which is a node package management. It allows you to install a lot of, sti uh, a lot of things inside your node environment. And it's basically um, a build tool for JavaScript developers. And recently it became like the default uh, tool to build anything web related. Is there any question like 
why did you see this uh, in studying? Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, so let's start on the inspector now. Okay. So uh, here you can see uh, you can go to this page, copy link address, to start debugging. So let's do this. Uh, let's go and this one. Hop. Uh, you have to use a V8 page browser for that, so with, uh, Chrome or Opera, uh, because it has to use the same engine as Node.js. So you see how here, this is a debugger, it's, it's the dev tool of Chrome. And here you see like the from target. It's because we have nothing running with uh, with the debug flag, debug index. Okay, so uh, the debugger is listening and the server is starting. Uh, let's reload. And now, oh, what's that? So this is actually, uh, this is, what is this exactly? It's not the right one. Yeah, good. Okay, so that's my code. So I see my code here. And here, look, I have a breakpoint. So it works exactly as a breakpoint. Fine. And here, you see like it's still waiting because the server hasn't answered yet. Why? Because I'm blocked here. Um, I can evaluate uh, here all the, all the stuff. So count, it's zero now. Uh, let's say uh, I want to advance a little bit. And now count should be one. Yep, okay. And you can go inside, like, what does res.send does exactly? I want to, to dive inside the function and then go step by step. So this is basically a classical debugger for Node.js. Very, very cool stuff. And very, very useful when you want, like, to... When you have nasty or tricky bug, uh, it's super useful. Okay, uh, so that's... That's about it for Node.js. Um, yeah. Is there any question about Node.js and tooling about this? Okay, so let's start with the last part about the browser. So basically it's where the web app uh, where it came from for this talk. Who here has heard about Yoman? Okay. And who is there anyone here who is using uh, a, um, a build tool like Grant or Gulp? Okay, few good, that's perfect. And Bower, does anyone here know? Okay, so um, basically, Yeoman is a is a tool which combines uh, these three Bower, Grant and npm. So npm is for Node. Grant is a build tool where you can register some tasks and tell okay. If uh, I want to run my test, and this is how they should be run. It's, you can see that as a make file from those who have done C or C++. It's a make file for JavaScript. And Bower is a package management for JS and CSS library. It's basically the apt gate, apt get for JavaScript. So Yeoman combines these three. Uh, and oh, let's do a small demo about Yeoman. Uh, Let's try Unicode. Uh, okay, and then you uh, let's say Ember. So, yeah. oh, you're right. Um, okay, you. Uh, you is a node module, but so MLS. that you can install. So here I'm running the Ember generator, which is basically what it is going to do. It's going to install a lot of uh, node package um, to create an Ember application. Do I want Twitter bootstrap for SaaS? Yes, please. And oh, here we go. So it creates a lot of files, and then it's going to run uh, Bower install and npm install. So here it, it, it's installing all the node package 
uh, required for the application, which include like the command line for grants, um, the tool to um, for the automatic test using Mocha, um, the SAS compiler. Uh, you can do that all, uh, in Node now, and a lot of things. Um, okay. And then it's going to use like grants. So why it's uh, compiling and loading stuff? Yep. Okay. Um, yo. Uh, yeah, about like being efficient. Work with recent hardware. Like if you have to wait five seconds because uh, your computer is that too slow, it's clearly a big problem. Um, no, I don't want to scream. Uh, um, so, um, Boer is like NPM, but for front, uh, front, uh, front, front end? Yes. Front end yes, so you can say Boer inside jQuery, and poof, you have jQuery inside your local file system. You don't, um, you don't have to like go to the website, check the version and stuff. You can say Boer install jQuery at this version, and poof, if you have it. Uh, you can say that, you can do that for Bootstrap or anything. Um, and grants provide a lot of things like live reload. When you change your file system, it automatically reloads the file. Perfect. You don't have to do alt, alt tab F5 every day, every time. Uh, and you can also like do some crazy thing like uh, if something change, you compile my SAS uh, into CSS. You compile my coffee script into JavaScript. Uh, you concatenate and minify everything, you put the new things inside this folder, you run the test, and uh, you start the browser and see if it's okay. And if everything is okay, you can also like, deploy on Amazon or do some really crazy things with that. Uh, Grunt is super cool. Is it done? With, is this human done? You! Okay, so now uh, npm is okay, and it's going to install Bower. Okay, it's going to take, so yeah. Now it's installing all the um, all the front end uh, resources. <coughs> Let's go back to the top where it's doing that. Um, okay. Uh, apparently the next talk, the next part is about the dev tools. Uh, I'd like to finish the more stuff before. Oh, perfect. So uh, what do I have here now? I have uh, a lot of things actually, not modules, app, test, uh, let's see what's inside the application. I have already my index, image, script. Uh, what's in interesting is what's inside script. Uh, this is uh, an Ember application, so I have everything there. Uh, and Grand Sir is actually going to uh, like compile and check everything and then open a browser. So here you can see uh, it's cleaning everything, it's replacing the HTML uh, to the uh, right one, uh, it's checking the templates, and now it's and now there is a server running. Okay, connect, and now I have a server on localhost 9000 uh, with my Ember application there. <coughs> and again by like some good data. Um, Yep. And here it is. And this is Ember. Uh, whoops. Uh, let's close the dev tool for the moment. Yeah. Uh, here you can see like Ember, Ember data. Yeah, I have Vandalbus, I have jQuery, every good, every, every good stuff from there. So I did nothing and I have my application, which is pretty cool. Uh, of course, like since you have all the files, you can customize everything. You can write your own generators. Yoman has actually about like more than 200 generators for about everything. Like uh, this presentation, uh, the base of the presentation has been generated using Yoman, like this presentation. And you can do like whatever you want. There are like HTML5 boilerplate, uh, native application, iOS application, whatever. Um, last part about the dev tools. Um, these are links to the documentation. I'm going to talk about the Chrome DevTool because that's the one I know best. Uh, Firefox DevTools are also pretty nice, but I don't I don't use <laughs> them that well, so I'm going to use the Chrome one. Um, so this one is full of demo. 
Uh, nope. Uh, so I think it was there. Um, yeah, right. Uh, first, H oops. HTML, please. And then Python. Uh, wait, what? Oh yeah, you have already something running there. Yes. Um, let's turn the port. Uh, how many? Is anyone here using like a CSS preprocessor, like less or SAS or Stylus? No one. Just you. SAS. Okay. SAS is cool. SAS is cool. Uh, anyway, um, go. For those who don't know, like, there are other languages which compile to CSS and they are much better, like you have variables, uh, nesting and lots of useful things. Um, so let's see that. I have here a copy of uh, uh, 1, 2, 3, 3, okay. So this is a copy of HTML5, please. Uh, which is a fine website about can I use some stuff. And here I'm going to be interested in this little thing. Inspect that. Okay, um, let's do this way. Okay. <clears throat> oh. Okay. Um, now I just have to prepare one more thing. Um, so this website has been uh, built with SAS. <coughs> okay, perfect. Um, so uh, it, I just it might be a little bit uh, tiny. Here it's written style.scss. So first good thing, I don't have the CSS here. Uh, also that the browser reads CSS. I have scss. That means that if I click here, I, I'm going to see the, the SCSS file. This is an SCSS syntax. So this is the first thing which is pretty cool. And let's say I want to change the color of the element here. Uh, from green, I want to change that to somewhere. So I click there, and I see, oh, OK. Actually, it's a mixin. Uh, so it's like a, a function which is reusable. So I will have to dig a little bit big, deeper. If I press Control or Command on Mac, you see everything like there, there is underline. So everything here is clickable. Let's click on background. And here I am, background. <coughs> and this is actually a variable with a color. And it darkens there. So OK, that makes sense. So let's, uh, here I actually want to exactly modify the color. So I Control click on the color. And here I am, inside the SAS file. Uh, let's try something funny like indigo. Control S. So here I save my file. And it's going to, in the background, uh, wait, what? Um, what's the thing? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, here. So this is the right file. OK. So if I modify this one in indigo. Uh, it's going to rewrite, uh, recompile the, the style, and I get a new version with Indigo. And in Chrome, you can actually uh, tell him to automatically reload, uh, automatically reload the generating CSS and check the CSS source map. Uh, the CSS source map that's what allow me. To directly like click on the indigo there and go exactly at the file definition where it is. So this is the first thing about uh, the dev tools. If they support source map, uh, you have a mapping between your pre-processed stuff and the output, and you can directly modify it inside the browser. So when you are tinkering with it, like yeah, and indigo is not very nice. Uh, you can just try other values, and when you are satisfied with that, you just save, and that's it. Cool. Yeah. So if you you read this the uh, CSS file in your develop tool, so it's going to save in local yes. system. 
Yeah. Uh, it's called Workspace uh, in the Chrome DevTool, which maps your uh, browser and the DevTool with your local file system, and then you can like directly modify it. And the only thing I have running is the background task, which recompiles the CSS into CSS. Uh, okay. Uh, and then there is more about the dev tool. So um, I have a file which is uh, And here, so here I have my elements, and I can 
check inside the code, it's really too small. Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay, so and I can see inside like and browse the elements uh, and stuff. Uh, so this is document the query selector, which is exactly the same as writing just dollar. This is not jQuery, this is an alias for the query selector. And if you want everything, uh, it's two dollar. You can also like by adding uh, this, you can access to the previously selected elements. Um, and so this is pretty pretty useful when you want to debug some stuff. And the last part is you can do uh, you can also like monitor the events. Uh, let's say I want to check. Uh, I want to know exactly when the resize event happens. So I monitor the event resize uh, on the Windows part. And now I go there and I resize it. And I lost my mouse here. And you see up here you see a resize event, another resize event. And here I'm going to put the full screen again. So I have the three resize events with the details on every event. Uh, if you want like, to know the targets and stuff. Um, that's actually very, very useful and I used it quite a lot because like debugging events in the browser is often a pain because they are intractable. And in the end you can also like do some completely crazy stuff uh, like uh, CSS styling uh, inside your console. So you have this kind of stuff inside your console which is completely uh, fun and it actually might be useful sometimes. Okay. Uh, how do you debug mobile browser? Um, mobile browser, you put, uh, you connect your mobile phone on USB on your laptop or desktop and then there is usually, in the Chrome, the dev tool have also a way, uh, it's called remote debugging. And it can like connect to the browser inside your phone and you can control it uh, remotely from the browser. Um, this is like, also again like there are lots of documentation about that. I know it's pretty you can do that pretty easily. And last thing about the dev tools is like here I demo the console, but so you have the elements. So this is a DOM tree network uh, to inspect every single request, and you can have like the headers, preview, response, and some how long everything took, the sources for the CSS, CSS, scripts, uh, timeline, if, if, if you want to do some profiling, uh, like this is high-end performance, profile it's, uh, so timeline and profile are closely linked. Uh, timeline show you uh, where the browser is spending time, and the profile is telling you uh, how the CPU is used. Um, the resources is like local storage and other things like that. Audit, um, it's close to profile. It's again to do performance tuning, and in the end, you have the console. And let's uh, back to the slide. And yeah, that's about it. So basically, you have to just memorize a few things, like learn to use your tools because you are using you are using them every day. Um, you can clearly like probably go faster for some stuff. Automate as much as possible. I avoid like uh, errors. Um, it's more fun because you don't have to do the same thing over again. And also you like use some build steps like grant for example. Uh, it's how you do automation on the front end side. Um, so <coughs> sorry. The whole goal is to minimize the friction. If you can stay focused on your task without anything which goes against you, uh, you're going to be way, way more efficient. And that's about it. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? Okay. Cool. Wait, uh, can mm -hmm. I use uh, the CSS dev tool with less? Um, I don't know. Actually, the dev tool is not linked to a CSS, but it needs source map. So if you have, uh, I don't know if the less compiler has source map support. If it has, then you can use the dev tool with less, no problem. If it uh, doesn't have source map support, then you cannot. 
it's pretty new like to run the SAS source map, you have to use the beta version. So I'm not sure it's there yet for less. Which beta version? Of the SAS compiler. I don't know for less. Okay. But basically just look for the source map and you will have that automatically as soon as the source map landed. Okay. Okay, I'll switch. Okay. Cool. Perfect. Uh, okay, so I'm I'm done with my talk. And the next one uh, is Marcus there, who is going to present uh Saint JS. Thanks. And I'm going to shut this down. Perfect. And stop is it you actually. So we have a